Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue working on the low noise amplifier by taking the concepts we analyzed last time and turning them into a circuit and analyzing it using LT Spice. So today I will be simulating the circuit to see exactly what sort of performance we should be expecting from it. So what are the actual things that the circuit will be able to do in real life? So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So let's start off by looking at the most important component in the schematic, the amplifying element, or in our case, an operational amplifier. Now the documents we looked at last time contain some very good operational amplifiers, some very low noise operational amplifiers. But depending on what components you already have in stock or what components are available at your local component distributor, you might not be able to get those components. So what I want to do is look at some other potential components. Now, one of the things I'm interested in is keeping the circuit small and compact. And for that, I want to use a dual op amp. So to have two op amps in the same IC package. Now, the first candidate on the list is the LM2904 or LM358. It, it comes under various names. And what makes this IC special is that it's one of the cheapest components you'll find. Now, unfortunately, the problem with this is that we don't have any sort of noise related information on the front page, or for that matter, throughout this data sheet. Now, I did manage to track down an older data sheet. So this is still from Texas Instruments. It's a bit older from 2004. And here we can see why they never put any noise related information. Because the noise is not that good. It's around 40 nanovolts per root hertz, which is quite a lot. So we will not be using this op amp. Next on the list is the LM833. Now, from the start, we can already see that this is a low noise op amp. So we're on the right track. It clearly states on the front page that it's a 4.5 nanovolt per root hertz, so much better than the previous one. But we don't get any other useful things. I mean, we find out that this 4.5 value is measured at one kilohertz, but we don't know anything about what happens throughout the frequency range. Now, again, if we look at a different data sheet, so this is the LM833, but made by Texas Instruments this time, again, we see the 4.5 nanovolt per root hertz, so it's a very similar op amp, same information in the table, so measured at one kilohertz, but we also find this graph. So how the noise density is spread out over a wider frequency range. And what we can see is that we have two distinct regions. We have flat thermal noise going from 200 hertz onwards, and then we have a much higher noise density at frequencies below 100 hertz. So basically this is flicker noise and then we have thermal noise. And the problem with this is that our useful bandwidth is from 10 hertz up to 100 kilohertz. So this 10 hertz to 100 hertz noisy range is not something we really want. I mean, if you have no other choice, this is a very good op amp, it's very cheap, but it has its problems. Final candidate on the list for today is this thing, the AD8676. Again, dual op amp, again, very low noise. So this is very low at 2.8 nanovolts per root hertz at one kilohertz. But if we look through the data sheet, we can also find this graph showing us the noise density throughout the spectrum. And here we can see that thermal noise starts much closer to 10 hertz than to 100 hertz like we had in the previous op amp. So this is a much quieter op amp at lower frequencies. Now, this is a more expensive op amp, so therefore it has some better performance. Now the final thing to do is to check the simulation models. So normally the simulation models should give the exact same noise spectrum that we see in the data sheet. And we can do that with a very simple spy simulation. What I did here is a simple circuit. I've got a differential power supply. I got my op amp connected in the unity gain configuration and I'm simply measuring its output noise. 
and then I can change the name based on which IC I want to test out. If we look at the AD86, we can see that its performance is very similar to what we've seen in the datasheet. So around 10 Hz, we go from the flicker noise to the thermal noise, and then it's quite flat at around 2.8. If we try out the LM833 with the same setup, we see that flicker noise is much higher and it stops at around 100 to 100 hertz. And then it flattens out at 4 point something. So it's not exactly 4.5 as in the datasheet, but it's very close. Now, just for experiment's sake, we can see what the LM2904 does and we see much, much higher noise values. So we see huge few hundred nanovolts at very low frequencies and then at around one kilohertz, we see 35 nanovolts, so not really 40, but very close to the data sheet. And then it flattens out at this value. So now that we got the op amp sorted out, let's move on to the actual circuit. Now this circuit needs to be both an amplifier, so the amplify the signal, that's what we're building, but it also needs to be a filter. So we need to have our bandwidth clearly defined between 10 Hertz and 100 kilohertz. And for that, we will use high pass and low pass filters. Now the high pass filters are done with RC filters. So these will be basically the DC blocking capacitors between the stages. But for the low pass, we will be using active filters. So we can start off by looking at amplifiers. And basically we can use the generic non-inverting configuration. So something like this, I set it here to amplify by a factor of 101. So 40 something decibels. And if we look at the output waveform, we see that we get our 40 decibels, but then at a few tens of kilohertz, it starts to drop off. Basically the problem here is the bandwidth of the op amp. If the op amp doesn't have enough bandwidth, you cannot use it to amplify too much. And we see the same behavior with the AD. So both of these op amps are 10 megahertz bandwidth op amps. And that's why we're getting this problem. What we'll need to do is to limit the gain a bit. So we won't be able to use factor of 100 amplification. We will need to reduce it a bit so that we still have correct gain at 100 kilohertz. So by reducing the gain, we can see that we have a much flatter response at around 100 kilohertz. So even a factor of 50 is a bit too much. So we'll be have to go a bit lower than this. So single stage amplification is completely out of the question we will be needing at least two stages of amplifiers. Now, the second thing we need to consider is the filtration aspect. So making low pass filters. And one of the things you could do is make RC filters. But the problem with this is the way in which it actually acts. So if we simulate the circuit real quick, we can see that we are filtering. We have a second order filter, but the drop off is very smooth. What I mean by this is that you go from flat response down to your 40 decibel per decade in a very smooth way. So the filter doesn't kick in instantly. Its effect is spread out over a wider bandwidth. Now, on the other hand, if we use an active filter, like we got on the left side, we can get the same slope. So 40 decibels, second order filter, but we have a much sharper transition. So we no longer have a very slow roll off. We go very quickly from flat to filtered. That's exactly what we can see here. So now the two filters are not working at the same frequency, but you can see the idea. So what's going on here? So to get the four order filter, we will need two of these circuits. So that means that we need two op amps for the amplifier, at least two op amps for the filter. So very similar to what we've seen in the application nodes. Now, in the interest of keeping things simple, we can combine the two effects. So have both the amplifier and the filter built around the same op amp, basically something like this. So what I did in this circuit is combine both the second order Butterworth filter with the non-inverting amplifier stage. So if we simulate this circuit, we see that we have 20 something decibels of gain. So the amplifier is amplifying, but we also have this nice 40 decibels per decade filtering action. So you go from 
flat gain into a very steep filtering mode. Now, of course, you can play around with the values to get better operations, different frequencies, but we can use this principle to compress our circuit a bit. So to only use two op amps to get both the amplification effect and the filtering effect. So I came up with this circuit. So this is a two stage amplifier and it's also a third order high pass filter. So we have these three RC groups and it's also a fourth order low pass filter. Thanks to the components around the op amps. So just to see how this thing performs, we can do an AC simulation on it. And if we look at the output, we see that this thing has a 60 decibel gain factor. So this will amplify by a factor of a thousand. One microvolt will be turned into one millivolt. But we can also see that on the low side, we have a minus three decibel point at around 10 Hertz. And then at higher frequencies, the minus three decibel point is at around 120 something, 130 kilohertz. So it's not perfect 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz, but it's close enough. And we have this little gain peak here, but that's okay. Now, the reason why the frequencies are not perfectly accurate is because this was what I came up with using standard components. So you can go out and use 1% components or something more precise than that, but this is what you can get with your regular 5% components. So now that we know that the gain is pretty good, let's see how it performs from a noise point of view. So that was the whole point, make a low noise amplifier. For that, we can perform a noise simulation. And if we look at the output, we can see that we will have approximately two millivolts of RMS noise. Or if we go to peak to peak, multiply this by around eight, close to 20 millivolts. So it's quite a lot of noise, but it's not that big if we consider the gain. So if we have 20 millivolts of output noise, that would be equivalent to around 20 microvolts of input noise. So with the circuit, we will be able to measure signals above 20 microvolts, which is not that bad. Now, if we look at the shape of this output noise, we can see that there's a nice peak here below 200 Hertz. So this is because of the op amp. So the op amp is giving us quite a lot of noise at low frequencies. Now, if we were to swap this op amp with the other op amp we've been looking at today, we see a completely different noise figure. And our total RMS noise went down from two millivolts to 1.5. Now we could potentially go even lower than this by working on the components a bit. So now we can look at the actual components and see which has the biggest contribution to the noise. So if we look at various resistors, we see that none of them really does much until we get here. So R10 has quite a substantial contribution. So does R4 and R3. And then R11 again has quite a small contribution. So these three 50 ohm resistors are the main noise contributors to the circuit from the passive component point of view. So everything other than the op amps. And this is why normally in such circuits, you have a separate gain stage from a separate filter stage. If this would be purely a gain stage, you would only have one of these resistors, not all three of them. But in the interest of simplicity, I will leave the circuit as it is. So final thing to analyze to make sure that everything is okay is look at the circuit from a transient point of view. So what I did here was add a transient simulation command and I changed the input signal into a sine wave that starts only after a certain amount of time and then stops. And the purpose for doing this is to see if there's any sort of instabilities in the circuit. So if the circuit starts oscillating without any signal and if the circuit remains stable when the signal is gone. So we see our 40 microvolt input signal. And if we look at the output, we see our 40 millivolt signal. So the gain of a thousand. And if we zoom in on the signal itself, we see that there's no oscillation before it and no oscillation after it. So the circuit seems to be stable. So when developing any sort of circuit, 
it's important to analyze it from different points of view. So always perform multiple types of simulation just to make sure that you didn't miss anything. But for now, the circuit looks okay, seems to be working fine. Next thing to do is to actually build it and see how well it performs. But that is the topic for next time. So for now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.